Is that good now? There, perfect, even better. Okay, so uh, yeah, my name's Michael Spalling. I, uh, I work at the University of Alberta up in Edmonton, Canada. And if you've, if you've never done security at a large research university, uh, things, things get pretty interesting. Uh, one of the things that we joke about is our production networks are just the bad guys' test environments. And despite joking about that, it's, it's the sad reality of it. Um, I've been there for about six years, uh, mostly in a security operations role. I work on a small team that's responsible for things like firewalls, intrusion prevention systems, incident response. Uh, shameless plug, but uh, a lot of that's actually going to be changing. About three weeks ago, I accepted a promotion to team lead. So now I'm going to be leading the team uh, that I've been working on in security for the last six years. So looking forward to whatever uh, opportunities that, uh, that brings up. And uh, get a, I got kind of interested in vulnerabilities and exploits a little over a year ago. I attended a conference in Vancouver called CanSec West, and it just blew my mind wide open uh, in regards to what, what can actually go wrong with a computer and what people are really capable of hacking. And ever since then, I was like, I, that's interesting. I really want to get involved in this. So I started kind of digging around, and um, one of the things that I did last year is going to be the presentation of, uh, or is what I'm presenting now. And uh, yeah, it's also my first national talk. I've done quite a bit of talks uh, at the university campus and just the local user groups in Edmonton, but this is my first time talking at a conference like this, so really excited. And on the bottom, those, those are things I like. If you like those things too, then there's things to talk about. And the picture, if anybody plays uh, World of Warcraft, that's proof that my wife actually let me bring Frostmourne to our wedding and get it in the photos. So there you go. Uh, so this is just a quick agenda. Here's, here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, a little bit about just some background, really, why, why you should care about this. Uh, whitelist abuse is actually kind of cool and fun, I think. Uh, and then we're going to go on a whitelisting tour. So I'll show you guys what I've been covering in different security products in the last year. Not necessarily vulnerabilities in a lot of them, but just, uh, just differences. And really what it comes down to is that everything is done differently. There really are no standards or agreed upon best practices for how to implement a whitelist. So you'll see that pretty quickly. Uh, when it's done, uh, I'm going to end the whitelisting tour on one specific issue that I found in two products that I'm then going to demo. So uh, I've got a live demo plan. There's a VM set up here. So if any of you have beer, just chug it now for the demo gods because it's probably going to go to hell. And the second one is pre-recorded. Um, the first one is against a product called Zamana Antilogger. Maybe you guys are familiar with it. Uh, the second one is against Malwarebytes. So I disclosed this issue to Malwarebytes last year. Uh, they paid a $1,000 bounty for it, and I'll show you guys what happened. So I thought that was pretty neat. And if there's time, we'll do a Q&A at the end. So if, if you're interested in this type of stuff, there is some research going on in this area. Uh, two people notably, Tavis Ramandi from Google's Project Zero and uh, Joxin Coret. These guys have been doing some really, really interesting things uh, with breaking security software. So it's not unexpected, but I think it's hilarious that the actual software that's designed to protect you in itself has flaws that can actually lead to your own compromise. So follow these guys and read up some of their research. It's really cool to what they were doing. Uh, the other thing that's out there are just whitelisting products. So things like AppLocker, McAfee Application Control. What, what these software is designed to do is instead of focusing on what is bad and identifying it and blocking it, with these programs, you just define what's good. And then only good is permitted. Everything else is, uh, is, is restricted. So I thought to myself when I wanted to start getting involved in this area, uh, what if I just combine those two? Um, let's just start there. You've got to start somewhere. So what if I just started by looking for vulnerabilities in security products ability to whitelist? And uh, turns out there are actually, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a thing. So first off, why, why should we care? Why even abuse whitelist in the first place? Uh, pretty straightforward. Whoever controls that whitelist controls what's permitted. Right? That's, that's something that should only be done by a trusted user or a system administrator or something. Um, your bad guys should not be able to control your whitelists. If a bad guy controls your whitelist, they control what's permitted into your environment, and now you've got a problem. So um, how are we going to be doing this? Well, I'll, we're going to start looking for potential uh, weaknesses in whitelisting implementations. And when we find one, uh, believe it or not, it's actually possible in some cases to replace the whitelist with a whitelist of our own. And uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you that going on here. So the only tool you need to do this to really get started is Process Monitor. If you've never used Process Monitor, grab it at that link. This is what it looks like. It's, it's just a piece of software that runs on Windows, and it, uh, it tells you everything that's going on. So it looks at your processes, and it tells you what files are being read and written to, registry keys being read and written to, a bunch of networking things. Uh, this, this, this is all you need. So the idea is to install a piece of antivirus software you want to poke at, 
have it detect a threat. And when it says to you, hey, here's this threat, what do you want to do? Permit, deny, you know, accept, ignore. Turn on process monitor, accept the threat so it gets entered into your whitelist, and then turn off process monitor. And it will show you what exactly the antivirus software or software did in the background uh, to, to modify its whitelist. So these are some examples that I have here. If you can't see them in the back, I apologize. Um, the problem with doing that though is that sometimes it can generate up to about 5,000 lines of entries. So this is where the bulk of the work is, is actually digging through these lines, searching, trying to find usually that literally one line that reveals where the whitelist is located. So the top one is uh, McAfee, I think it's uh, Endpoint Protection 2015. And I was able to find that, it actually it writes to a registry key that was revealed by uh, Process Monitor. The bottom one is uh, Sophos uh, Cloud Security. And it actually writes to something called machine.xml. So what I learned over a year of poking at various products is there, there, is, there is no rhyme or reason to how whitelists are implemented. Everyone's doing it differently. So this is just uh, a tour of what I found. So Zamana Antilogger, their whitelist is stored in app data in the locally logged on user. A bunch of them have them in various program data locations. Some of them just simply write registry keys. If you look at the actual file types, we've got INI files, DAT files, XML files, plain old straight up text files. Uh, Webroot I thought was interesting because they actually have two whitelists. Um, the, the whitelist that permits malicious URLs is stored in a text file in the uh, file system, whereas the whitelist that permits uh, malicious files is stored in a registry key. So not that I think there's anything wrong or bad with that, it's just an example of, of someone doing it differently. So the next step is if you go and dig around in these files, figure out the structure and what exactly they look like. And this, this is the same thing. There, there is no rhyme or reason here, it's all different. This is from uh, Sophos Cloud Security. They edit something called machine.xml, which is actually a, a very large configuration file. So it contains the whitelist amongst a whole bunch of other things. But the important thing to notice is that there's actually three separate ones. So the whitelist for on access scan, on demand scan, and right click scan are actually controlled independently. So if someone wants to go and actually manipulate as an attacker someone's whitelist, understand what software they're using and understand how their configurations are set up. Because if you accidentally uh, permit your threat by modifying only right click, it's still gonna get caught by on demand and on access. And then here's one of the failures. Um, if you look at the act, what's actually in the file, the only thing that's in here is the name of the file from cloud.exe. So I'm not gonna go on record and say it was Sophos. Um, I did come across a product, pretty sure it was them, where the name of the file is all that's in the whitelist. It doesn't look for anything else. It doesn't look for where the file is located. It doesn't look for a hash. It just looks for the name of the file. And if that file is found anywhere on the file system, it's permitted to run. So I took njrat, renamed it to something like michael.exe, permitted michael.exe, and njrat would run on the system anywhere simply because we, uh, we had just permitted the name. So this is extra interesting because if you're an attacker and you can convince someone to give up your whitelist and their software works in this manner, you don't even have to modify the whitelist. All you gotta do is rename your threat to something that's already in the whitelist and it'll just, it'll just come on in, which is pretty cool or terrible depending on your point of view. Uh, so this is, this thing's getting a little better. This is McAfee. McAfee did the same thing. They just looked at the name, but they also went and uh, put the location on here. So in this case, malware.exe, my generic test. Uh, this, this will only get blocked if it's found in this location. Uh, anywhere else in the file system, it will continue to run. Pretty straightforward. This was the web root text file. It's literally a text file with just URLs appended to it. Um, if, if you tinker with it enough and you just remove like some of the, if you override some of the permissions on the file, uh, I was able to just manually edit this directly and have the changes here reflect in the, uh, in the software. Not really a huge problem, but there you have it. And then, and then we get a little better. So this is WebRoot and this is their, um, their file hashing. So if you permit something through WebRoot, what it actually does, it just has the hash on here, that's it. So if the hash changes, the file will get caught once again. It doesn't care where in the file system it is, as long as the hash matches. But one thing that's interesting is their whitelist doesn't just control malware, it also controls protected applications. So if your protected app is in here, uh, I believe the way it works is that the software will prevent any changes to it. So if you can inject into this whitelist, make sure to set uh, protected app to yes, and then nothing will actually be able to touch your, your threat, which I thought was pretty neat. The last thing, and this is, this is where the fun begins and the demos kind of kick in, is every now and then this happens, and I found this twice now, is uh, some developers, I'm gonna assume, thought to themselves that, hey, we're gonna encrypt 
these uh, these these malware, sorry, these whitelist files. And because they're encrypted, they can't be tampered with, so everything's A-OK. -okay. And then I learned as I was playing around with them that that key that they used to encrypt and decrypt the file is actually hard-coded into the application. So every single installation of these two products can read and write any, any configuration file or any exclusions file from any other installation. So don't do that. Uh, there's actually two other issues here. And this, this is where it's, uh, the first and second bonuses come in, is those exclusion files, if you look at the properties, the permissions and the properties, full control in both cases was granted to the locally logged on non-administrative user. So now we have a file that's been encrypted with a hard-coded key that can be, mod that can be you know, deleted, uh, copied, overwritten by the locally logged on user. And there's also no write lock on it. So you can, as long as the program's running, you can still just straight up delete these files and you know, different things happen. If there's no file there, it might recreate it or do something. But uh, this, this actually opens the door for some pretty interesting malicious abuse. Uh, so what I decided to do is I did not go through the effort of actually trying to figure out um, what the key was. In the case of Malwarebytes, um, you guys, uh, I mentioned Tavis or Mandy earlier. I've never met the guy, but um, I disclosed this to them in uh, September. And about two months later, he disclosed it but, uh, to them as well, because he found the same thing. But he actually went through the effort of figuring out what is that key. And he found it, and he was able to then decrypt the files and figure out a lot of structural issues within the files that could potentially lead to uh, code execution amongst a bunch of other things. So what I decided to do is uh, just create a new thread or create a new whitelist from a completely different installation and copy it over. And uh, so all I did is I grabbed a trial version on a different computer. Uh, that's, that's one of the interesting things here is the trial versions for all of this software that I've been testing um, also has that same key in it. So whether using a trial version or a full paid product, doesn't matter, that same key is hard coded. So you don't even have to invest in the product. This literally costs you nothing financially uh, to go and poke with. You don't have to pay them $50 or 60 bucks for their product, get the free trial version. Once you have that, you install it and have the trial version detect your threat. And then you take that and when the, threat, and when the version says, hey, do you wanna permit this? Your answer is, yeah, sure do. And then you have a wonderful new version of the whitelist, which you can then move to your target machine, overwrite their whitelist, and the net result is the system will, will permit your threat. So uh, I'm gonna move the demo time here. Uh, I'm gonna request that we turn the camera off. That's a cue. Uh, not because not what you're gonna see is absolutely crazy or anything. Um, it's just I, I am here as a representative of the University of Alberta. I'm not representing myself, and I do have some professional standards I have to adhere to according to them. Uh, both of these issues, um, they're, they're not fixed. Uh, this actually works on the most recent builds of Malwarebytes and Zamat.
find when I talk about this type of thing, at least at university and with coworkers and friends, is um, everybody, like I should say, nobody, I'm sure you guys all understand this, uh, under really know the type of work and failure that goes into these types of exploits, right? I'm standing here 20 minutes showing you two what I think are cool exploits against two products, but the reality is there was a lot of failure involved in getting it to the point where I can confidently talk about it and have it work in a demo, right? Failure after failure after failure. So things that didn't work, um, I've yet to actually see a product where just editing the files directly immediately reflects uh, in the application. I always have to seem to restart a process or a service. So where I plan on going from here, or if any of you guys want to do this yourselves, is trying to find a way to do this that um, makes those, those changes uh, take effect immediately without having to resort to resetting stuff. That's probably the biggest thing. Uh, what's next? I would encourage all of you, do try this at home. Uh, I think it's pretty, pretty cool, interesting, neat stuff. Uh, one note though is self-protection modules do stop this um, every single time. I've never seen a program where turning on the self-protection module allows me to then overwrite um, a whitelist. The problem is that in many cases are actually turned off by default. Uh, some companies also lock their self-protection module behind a paywall where you don't get it in the basic service. You gotta buy the premium version of that. Uh, I think if they're really interested in actually protecting you, that type of functionality should just be in the base product. Some companies do, but not everyone does. Uh, so far, I, I've poked at seven, when I put this slide together, I poked at seven different products, three of which are vulnerable, two I demoed today. Uh, Virus Total has over 50 different products on their list uh, at some point in the future, or if anyone wants to help, just pick one and go through it and see if this type of issue is present. If it is, report it. You know, you might even get money out of it, who knows. And it's pretty simple uh, process and tools, right? I don't, I don't have a degree in computing science. I'm a really, really, really terrible programmer. Uh, but I just, even I was able to figure this stuff out. So if you're sort of new to this and you want to get involved, this is a really great place to start looking. Grab process monitor, grab some time, and uh, start there. So one last slide, and that's just um, huge thanks to three key people. Uh, first off, University of Alberta, just for really putting up with me and all the opportunities. Uh, secondly, to Totemkoff, I don't think she's in the room, but uh, Megan and I actually met um, virtually back in January of this year uh, in our professional lives, and I told her over the phone one afternoon that, hey, you know, I've been doing some work that I would love to share with people, and she says, well, I, I'm, I know this thing, it's called Proving Grounds. Um, call for presentations is going out, and you should submit one and, and hope for the best. Here I am. So had that conversation ever happened, I, I owe her a... I meant some out of gratitude. And finally, to Richo. Richo's in the very back row there looking at his phone with his uh, pink hair. <laughs> uh, Richo was my mentor for this. Um, absolutely, absolutely awesome. Um, can't even begin to really put into words how, how amazing you've been. I, I look at my original presentation I gave you like five months ago, and I look at this one, and so much of what you have said and guided me on is reflected in here. So thank you, and I would, I would encourage you to continue to mentor um, here. Whoever, whoever gets you, honestly, is incredibly lucky. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. So that's, uh, that's what I got, and I think we got like two, two minutes, I think, so. Questions? Good stuff, Michael. Thank you. Uh, questions? At one point you were showing. At one point you were sh <laughs> At one point you were showing hashes, I think you had NK and something, yep. .exe. Did you figure out what method they were using to hash, and was it just hashing the path? Was it hashing the executable name, or was it it's, um, it's using MD5 itself? hash, is what I've seen in almost every scenario. Uh, MD5 hash, and it's just hashing the executable. It's not hashing the path or anything. Uh, your two demo is uh, need under administrator, and I want to know if we don't have under administrator and uh, we need to bypass the USD and uh, I want to ho I want to know you how to deal with it <laughs> if, if and I knew the answer to that I would totally tell you um, right now I have no idea how to bypass Windows UAC at this point um, one thing that I do know is that Microsoft doesn't consider UAC to be a security measure um, I've been reading up on some issues with that and people have disclosed to them vulnerabilities and getting around it and they, I don't even think they pay bounties for it because they don't consider it to be a security bypass. Um, how to do it, not, not in my area of expertise, unfortunately. Oh, uh, actually, um, generally, we, we want to bypass the USC. We will uh, using the injunction and injunction into Explorer mm -hmm. and uh, use the Explorer E and get the um, uh, administrator. So cool. the, the process, will make 
uh, antivirus to detect the injunction. Okay. Yes. So if you can, if you can uh, send me an email with that, that'd be really cool. I like looking at that further. Thanks. Hey man, great talk. Um, Thank you. Did you talk at all about, uh, or did you research uh, cleaning up after yourself? So would it be easy enough just to rewrite the file once you're done? Is that something that you looked at? Yeah, um, I've, I've never actually considered doing that. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of where I've kind of put thought in that area is where would something like this really be useful? Um, that's kind of where I stopped. Is once I once it's useful cleaning up after yourself, yeah, that's a good point. I guess in theory, sure, you could definitely just put the original whitelist back or put a clean one there. Um, one of the questions that, I, uh, that I've had when I show like just friends this, um, kind of tied into that, is usually they say, if, if, you can just, um, if you can just shut down the program, why even bother going further with the whitelist abuse? And my answer is, well, it really depends on what, uh, what you're doing as an attacker, right? If your goal is to get in, get your stuff and get out, then there's no need to really clean up or anything. By the time you have what you need, you're long gone. Um, I think something like this would probably be beneficial if you're going for uh, persistence and you want your threat to stay there as undetected as long as possible. Um, I've actually encountered that real life uh, where, we, uh, where one of my former jobs was to manage the antivirus console for a large oil company in northern Alberta. It's about 5,500 workstations. And every morning I'd get a report that showed all the systems that were turned on that never actually uh, talked home to the antivirus mothership. And I had to figure out why. And in one case, it was because antivirus got on there and disabled the product. If they had just whitelisted themselves, we probably never would have found it. So yeah, I've, I haven't really put much thought into cleaning up. My focus is always on, let's just screw with it and talk about it that way. <laughs> Thanks. So one more question between you and lunch. Anyone? So um, would it be an oversimplification to just make a, an educated guess of processes that are, or applications that are most likely to be whitelisted and launch a campaign based on that, like notepad.exe and yeah. you know, hope for the best? Yeah, probably. So things like Notepad, Explorer, whatever random obscure thing might be out there. Well, not necessarily random obscure, but yeah, I think you could, you could do that. Um, where other of my thoughts have also been is how much effort do you want to put into like how much research do you want to put into your target? If you know they're using this particular prog program, you know the whitelist works like this. Um, where my thoughts are mostly stopped is social engineering. Find a target and just, hey, I'm so-and-so from IT. Can you send me a screenshot of this? Have them send it to you, and then you have the whitelist. But yeah, I think it would probably work. Just whitelist generic things and hope for the best, yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, Michael. And